Now, I'm Christine, the chair of Exmouth and District U3A, and I'd like to introduce oh in to you this morning, who most of you know. He joined our U3A in August 2019. He responded to a request, actually, to join our committee from um, Sandy McQueen, who's here on the call this morning. So we're really glad that he got involved with our U3A because he's made such an enormous difference to us all. He was secretary for a long time. And importantly, during the lockdowns, um, he and John, my husband, Morris and I, we formed a technical team. And Ian was a strong support in this because of his technical knowledge. And uh, between all of them, um, they sorted out and decided that Zoom was probably the way forward to keep in contact with our members during the lockdowns. And so we started um, weekly sessions, actually, uh, which went very well. And um, Ian has been doing that and editing um, the presentations from different people. And he's got really skilled at that, which has been great. Uh, he takes on many roles for our U3A. He's our Facebook admin, um, a keen advocate for that, and uh, keeps a daily lookout for what's going on and who's posting and things, which is brilliant. That's a great communication from our members. Um, he assists John with YouTube, um, our own YouTube site, which is great as well. No, he keeps yeah. a webcam going over Exmouth Marina uh, day and night um, so you can see what's going on down there as well. And he's got a real scientific background, which he's kept up with all his interests and everything. Very creative. He's able to think outside the box. He's curious, thinking, why do things happen? How do things work or they don't work and what might have gone wrong? And he looks at the detail. He's interested in data. He loves graphs. <laughs> he likes analysing. He's a critical thinker and problem solver. So this title that he's come up for his presentation is an ideal topic for him, I think. Heroic failures. Um, so over to you, Ian. And... Thank you very much for doing this this morning. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Ian. Um, Alex... Christine phoned me up a, a while ago and said, uh, you said you give a talk, Ian. Uh, can you uh, let me know what it is with a synopsis by the end of the day? So I thought, oh, right, OK. Um, so I had a quick think. And uh, as you uh, will probably realise, I have one or two things on the back burner so i thought well this this is this is one of those things so i'll put together a talk about failures um and here it is heroic failures i'll talk about various failures and discuss details of how and why that first photo was the failure of the tacoma narrows bridge in washington in 1940 it was designed to be the most flexible bridge ever. Unfortunately, it was slab sided and so any wind couldn't just blow through it. The wind caught it and caused resonance. In other words, the, uh, the, the wind caused it to uh, vibrate and, and found its resonant frequency. And as you know, that if anything vibrates at its resonant frequency, it amplifies and continues and gets worse. Uh, so the bridge then swayed uncontrollably and eventually failed. And this is what happened. You can see that uh, that's not going to end well, is it? And here's another view of it uh, from a driver's point of view this time. Um, glad I'm not in that car. Um, I think if I was, I would soon plummet to the depths of the water below. So why do structures fail? Could be due, for example, to faulty design, unauthorized design changes during construction, wrong materials or materials degradation, service conditions different from those anticipated, lack of appropriate engineering understanding. 
uh, and there are probably lots more. Here's another failure, the Dee Bridge disaster in 1847. And you can see the bridge has failed and uh, it's a railway bridge and the train ended up in the water. Killing five and injuring nine. So what do we know about that one? The bridge was built using cast iron girders. Cast iron is strong in compression, but brittle in tension or bending. They were worried that some wooden beams on the bridge may catch fire. Uh, there had been a recent fire on the Great Western Railway. So they added ballast to protect the beams. That added a lot of extra weight. Wrought iron girders fixed to the cast iron trusses to reinforce them didn't reinforce the trusses at all. So that was a design problem. The, the third of those was something that hadn't been anticipated and the people who added ballast didn't realise the implications for the strength of the bridge. So the causes of that accident were faulty design, changes to the design, inadequate material strength. Why is cast iron brittle? It's useful to have a look at how materials deform and what makes them strong. We'll look at these in more detail uh, and we'll just say a bit about cast iron a little later on. So crystal structure makes them strong. Resistance to deformation, what resists deformation? Difficult dislocation movement, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, work hardening, again, I'll mention that, precipitates. And then materials deform according to what we call a stress-strain curve, and I'll talk about that a little bit later too. Metals have a crystal structure. Yes, they do. Uh, on the left, you can see a lattice structure. Those red balls are the metal atoms, and they're arranged in a regular lattice. And uh, each lattice has a unit cell shown on the right. That's a simple unit cell with atoms at all four corners of the cube. Sometimes there are atoms in the middle of each face, and that's called a face-centered cubic unit cell. Uh, all of these different metal structures have different properties. And I mentioned dislocations. Is a crystal lattice always perfect? No, very few things are. The imperfections are called dislocations. They can take various forms, but each dislocation helps metals to deform. And you can see in this diagram that little plane of atoms is inserted between the regular lattice. And the existence of that uh, is called a dislocation. You can see the, the major lattice bends around here and that causes stresses to develop. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. So lattice imperfections are called dislocations and they can help metals to deform. Here's how. that extra plane of lattice can move as the metal stressed. And what it does, of course, is move to move along the metal lattice, thereby resulting in its deformation. Put it another way, it's like moving a whole rug by simply moving a rook in the rug. It makes it easier than sliding the rug all at once. I'm sure everybody's experienced that, and this diagram shows that you can move the rug from left to right simply by move, by making that rug in the in the rug and moving it along the rug till it gets to the other end. And that's how dislocations help metals to deform. What do dislocations look like? Well, under a transmission electron microscope. This is a stressed bit of metal and the dark lines are dislocations and they move because the stress causes them to move. And they're dark because that bit of lattice, 
that I showed you earlier, where it was stressed, where the extra bit of uh, metal plane ends, that, con that causes contrast. Uh, in an electron microscope. In other words, it causes the electron beam to scatter, showing up as a dark image. And these uh, images here show a dislocation or dislocations moving under the application of stress. So I've said that metals deform by movement of dislocations. Anything that stops the movement of dislocations makes the metal stronger. For example, if dislocations tangle with other dislocations, that means they can't move, and that's called work hardening, which you may well have heard of, I don't know. The other thing that stops dislocation movement is bumping up against another phase or impurity. Uh, so if we've got precipitates or uh, bits of another compound in the metal, uh, that's called precipitation hardening. Heat treating can cause a high temperature structure to be retained at room temperature, so the structure is stressed at room temperature and contains unusual, unusual phases. And that's how the quenching and tempering of steel ha happens. Uh, it, it all, all of it uh, stops dislocations moving or makes it harder. I mentioned precipitates, deposits of another composition can hinder dif dislocation movement and so strength, strengthen the metal. And these are schematic diagrams of the black line is a dislocation. The stress causes it to want to move that way and the precipitates stop it moving. That means the metal's harder. So thinking back to the D bridge disaster, why is cast iron brittle? It's brittle because it contains a lot of carbon and other elements, creating more internal stress. The carbide impurities, often in the form of graphite flakes, allow cracks to pass through the casting easily. Um, cast iron contains a lot of carbon. What's the difference between that and steel? Steel is much purer and has very little carbon, but enough to, to produce some precipitates that uh, cause strength, but it doesn't have the brittleness of cast iron, which has a lot of carbon. Um, I'm nearly finished talking about uh, what makes metal strong, but just a little bit more, and then we'll move on to some more disasters. I mentioned the stress-strain curve. If you get a piece of metal and pull it and measure the stress versus how long it stretches. So stress up there and strain along here. A brittle material has a lot of stress that doesn't extend very far and then it breaks. A ductile material, in other words, a material that can that, that isn't brittle, goes, when stress is applied, it extends a bit more and it extends a lot more. And you get to the stage where it extends very much with the same stress. And then it breaks. So a ductile material extends a lot. And a brittle material only extends a little bit. Where that straight line changes to this curve is called a yield stress. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute, but not, not to any great depth. So two general comments to help you understand how metals behave. The yield stress is the minimum stress required to make dislocations move. Below the yield stress, dislocations haven't moved. So when you take the stress off, the metal is elastic and goes back to its original size. And that's what the yield stress means. Hardening iron and steel simply means to put obstacles in the way of the dislocations, making it harder for them to move through the crystal. So that's enough of that. Uh, give you a little bit of a feel for how materials behave when they're stressed and what makes them uh, behave better and what makes them behave worse. 
Ian, can I just, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yes. can I just ask you a question directly from that? What yeah. I'm not sure, that's absolutely fascinating. What I'm not sure about is the pace, the speed at which dislocation moves. Is that something you could... They, they, they move at the sort of speed that the metal deforms. In other words, if you pull a piece of metal, as it extends, it extends because the dislocations move. So it's it's not very fast, but it depends on how quick how how quickly you apply the stress. If it's an impact, then the then the dislocations can't move fast enough, and uh, the metal the material breaks. So uh, an impact stress, in other words, is an, almost an instantaneous stress, stresses the metal more than the dislocations can accommodate that stress. So the metal breaks. As long as you've got dislocation movement, movement, the metal's fairly ductile and it will just extend. We're not talking about very fast speeds. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I was just trying to get, in, get it clear in my head how long, how the longest could be. <laughs> but that depends on circumstances, as you say. Thanks. Um, so that's... Quite, that's quite a, a lot to take in about the behaviour of metals. But anyway, I hope that sort of helps you to understand a little bit about what's going on in the scientific sense. So that's a brief look at what makes metals strong. What has this got to do with failures? Remember the Comet aircraft disasters? The de Havilland Comet was the first passenger jet aircraft. On the 10th of January 1954, 20 minutes after takeoff, the first production comet broke up in midair. What happened? Stresses around the window corners were much greater than expected because of the stress concentrating effect of sharp corners. This caused stresses from repeated cabin pressurization and depressurization to form and grow fatigue cracks which eventually split the whole cabin. If you don't already know, cabin pressurization uh, happens as the plane gains height. Uh, as, the, as the air pressure reduces, the cabin's pressurized in order to maintain a reasonable air pressure for the, uh, for the passengers in the plane. When it lands, Cabin pressurization isn't needed, so it depressurizes. And so every takeoff and landing has a cabin pressurization and depressurization cycle. And that caused fatigue cracks, which split the whole cabin. So here's a, a, a diagram of an, an, an aluminium fuselage, rivets, uh, rivet holes, and that's the sort of area the crack. Uh, formed and spread and of course if a crack forms and then extends that means uh, eventual failure will happen and here's a piece of the crack fuselage recovered afterwards and you can see here for example that we've got a crack growing from the relatively sharp corners of the window similarly here and that was that happened because the designers didn't appreciate the effects on stress concentration of sharp corners. Another one, Concorde. The first supersonic passenger plane suffered a fatal crash in July 2000 simply because a titanium alloy strip which had fallen onto the runway from a previous plane. The strip was picked up by the tyres of Concorde and thrown into a full fuel tank, causing a fire and loss of the plane. That's a famous photograph. I think everybody remembers that one. The Challenger disaster. On 28th of January 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger broke apart 73 seconds into its flight. And again, that's an iconic photograph that everybody remembers seeing, I'm sure. What happened? Have you ever seen a rubber tube cooled in liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees centigrade, then hit with a hammer? Some of us have seen that, but if you haven't, here's what happens.
hit it with a hammer and the rubber tube just breaks, it just shatters. So when rubber gets really cold, it becomes brittle. On the day of the Challenger launch, temperatures, temperatures were at a record low. Warnings were given, but they were ignored. The rubber O-rings between the solid fuel boosters were so brittle that they burst and the rocket exploded, causing the Challenger disaster. Why were O-rings used in the first place? NASA wanted to spread the shuttle manufacturing around different companies. Only a certain length of booster could be transported to the site, so they had to make them in sections and fasten them together on site. The consequent joints were sealed by rubber o-rings, so, so it, was, it arose because they had to make them in sections, basically, in order to transport them. And here's a, a cross-section of the original booster rocket joint. We've got the top section of the rocket and the bottom section, both labelled A, a. B is the primary O-ring seal. C is the secondary O-ring seal. The booster contractor engineers at Morton Firecall knew it was too cold and tried to stop the launch. One told his wife, it's going to blow up. They were overruled by managers, but they refused to sign a document which stated that it was safe to fly, which I think is a good decision. For subsequent, it took a long time to, 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 to sort this out. Subsequently, they redesigned that joint between the two parts of the booster rocket. So on the left is the original. On the, on the right is the new design, much more complicated. And if you'll notice, they've got a joint heater. So they eventually, or too late, of course, realized that they've got to keep that joint and its O-rings warm enough so that the O-rings don't become brittle and burst. So there was a failure that wasn't a surprise to scientists. Managers were willing to risk the mission and kill the astronauts simply to maintain a schedule. Ian, when the when the O-rings get cold and go brittle, when they warm up again, does the rubber recover or is it dam permanently damaged? Uh, it does recover, but uh, if it was me, I would take account of the fact that it's gone through that temperature cycle and uh, wouldn't rely on them working. How cold does it have to be? I'm just thinking of car tyres. <laughs> oh, much colder than car tyres. <laughs> okay. Uh, experience. We're talking uh, sort of minus tens of degrees centigrade. Okay, thank you. So don't, don't worry about your car tyre. <laughs> now, uh, next, other failures have arisen just from bad luck and lack of attention. The worst UK railway, ac railway accident, the Quintins Hill Rail Disaster, occurred in Scotland near Gretna Green in 1915. This led to 226 deaths and 246 injured. A train ran into a straight stationary train, then another train hit the wreckage. And here's a schematic diagram of what happened. So... The orange train was shunted onto that line. That one was shunted onto the bypass and they forgot the orange train was there. Let a train go along and then the purple train hit the wreckage. I'll just let that play again. So the signalman overlooked safety procedures and forgot about the stationary train below in orange. That's enough about transport. What about buildings? Remember Ronan Point, Canning Town, East London? At 5.45am on the 16th of May 1968, Mrs Ivy Hodge went to put the kettle on. 
lit a match and had the shock of her life. The resulting gas explosion blew out the load-bearing walls which had been supporting the four flats above. Ivy Hodge survived, having been blown across the room and clear of the collapsing walls. Four others died and 17 were injured. So what happened there? The tower block was built as cheap, affordable, prefabricated housing. Turns out that the joints connecting the vertical wall to the floor slabs were weak and the building hadn't been designed to withstand an internal gas blast. Another case of faulty design. And you could say uh, design that was meant to be cheap. Another one, the Hyatt Regency Hotel Walkway in Kansas City, Missouri. In 1981, the walkway collapsed, killing 114 and injuring more than 200. This doesn't seem to be well known, actually, and I, I was surprised when I, when I found it. Uh, but it's, it's a, a famous example of another problem. So what was that other problem? There'd been an unauthorised design change during construction by people who clearly had little understanding of how loads were transferred in the design. Every load has got to be transferred to somewhere else uh, and then finally uh, transferred mostly to the ground. So there has to be a transfer of load uh, that it, uh, and every component has to be strong enough to support that load. So here we've got a load called 2P that is hanging on this bar. And 2P arises because the, the thing that's hanging has a downward load of P. So that nut has a load of P on it from this downward load. And then this bar is also transferred to another part of the structure, which then carries the remaining load P. So 2P supports that P and that P. And the nut only has to support that P being load. So originally the nut holding the walkway carried half of the load and the hanger transferred the rest to another part of the structure. So somebody who didn't understand what was going on thought it would be a good idea to just change it when they were building it. The next slide says the unauthorized modification assumed that it was okay to hang the lower structure using a separate hanger. They failed to understand that the nut was then subjected to twice the design load. So this new hanger was carrying the P of the structure below it. But because they put this new hanger in place rather than continuing this one, the nut then had to support two P. That P and that P. They failed to understand that the nut was then subject to twice the, des the design load. A nut joint failure just waiting to happen. And it did. What about other structures and other types of failure? Corrosion can clearly eat away at metal and reduce its thickness and therefore affect its ability to carry a load. But people fail to realize that corrosion can cause failures in unexpected ways. Corrosion can affect the surface structure and properties of the metal. Secondly, growth of oxide interfaces can deform fastenings and potentially break them. If a component sits in a hot pressurized carbon dioxide environment, for example, a gas-cooled nuclear power station cooling circuit, its surface can absorb some carbon and that can change its mechanical properties. The stress distribution isn't constant across the section and this must be taken account when deciding its strength. The surface is stronger but more brittle and can crack more easily. So it's not all good news. You might think making the surface stronger would be 
good news, but if it's more brittle, it isn't. Here's the Taj Mahal of all places. If you get oxide growing in the gaps between components, the thickening can stress the component and break it. Iron strips hold masonry together in the Taj Mahal. The stone components were stressed by oxide growth and then broke here. So where the, the iron goes into the uh, stone, oxide grows and it's cracked the stone. So you think that uh, oxide or rust just, just takes away metal, but it does more than that if it's at an interface. So again, it isn't properly appreciated that oxide can grow at metal interface and the oxide is so strong it can deform the adjacent metal. That's called oxide jacking. It's only limited by the availability of oxidizing gases and remaining metal. Since the gases can diffuse to the metal surfaces, the oxide continues to grow. Here's a photograph I took myself a while back. Reinforcing bars in reinforced concrete. Rainwater gets in and the steel bars rust. The expansion causes the concrete to break away and, and spall. It's called spalling. That causes the steel bars to be further exposed to the weather. And now for something completely different. Predicted failures which weren't failures at all. Fastenings in high temperature, high pressure carbon dioxide can be extended by growth of oxide at interfaces. This can be accelerated in the laboratory and here's a bolt sample that has ultimately broken because of growth of oxide. So you've got all these interfaces, washers, nuts and everything, which uh, exaggerated the effect. And just the growth of oxide, nothing more, extends the bolt and it breaks. Now we talked about stress concentrations where the section changes. Bolts in this circumstance there's always break at the, at the first free thread. That's where you get a stress concentration. So the stresses are higher and that's where the bolt breaks. So what, you might think. Gas cool nuclear power station internals are subject to oxidation. Nuclear power stations must be provided with a periodic safety case in order to continue to be allowed to operate. This covers every aspect of their construction and operation and must be prepared according to agreed rules and procedures. One of the many things covered is their ability to cope with oxidation. Eventually, after many years, the safety predictions indicated that some of the bolted joints in the boilers could be broken. The problem was samples taken from the reactor itself showed that no joints had actually failed. There was clearly something wrong with the safety case predictions. What had happened was that the predictive methods assumed that all the components of the joint were made of the same material, whereas quite different types of steel were used in different places. What to do? I was working in that field at the time, and of course that's why I'm talking about this. I analysed the stresses in the joints and how different steel compositions would react to these stresses. I wrote new safety case analyses to prove that bolts predicted earlier to have failed were still intact. Trouble was, my equations couldn't be solved analytically. In other words, you couldn't use simple algebra to solve the equations. Again, what to do? I know I write a computer program to do it. That was the first page of over 60 pages of Fortran programming. So I could then predict the behavior of real bolted joints composed of different materials and do it properly. 
my predictive methods became part of the safety case calculations employed throughout the UK. My analysis was also used by the French and the Japanese for their gas cool reactor safety cases. This is an example of improved understanding leading to a more realistic assessment of behaviour. Finally, all of these examples mean that we now understand how to prevent structures from failing, don't we? What do you think? No, of course we don't. Remember the Italian road bridge, Fuente Morandi, as recently as 2018? What happened? A span of the bridge in Genoa, northwest Italy, collapsed during a rainstorm, killing 43 people. The bridge was cable stayed with a concrete deck. This produced a lighter, stronger bridge, or so it was thought. Crucially, there were only four cables per tower and the cables were sheathed in reinforced concrete. Salty sea air was able to penetrate the concrete and corrode the cables. They eventually broke and the bridge collapsed. That's, that's a, a perfect example of a collapsed bridge, I think. I'm glad I wasn't in that green lorry there. And that's another view. The cables were encased in concrete to protect them. This doesn't work and made it nearly impossible to inspect them too. A general comment, the weather always wins, however hard you try to stop it. We now inspect our bridge cables periodically and sometimes listening to them electronically and detecting any pings, which mean a wire has failed. We also visually inspect them. And here uh, is a, a double wedge between uh, the cables of a multi-strand uh, bridge support uh, cable, inspecting the state of the cables at the very center of these uh, support cables. When you've done that, you've got to clamp the cables back together and here are cables being so clamped. And then finally, here's a, a, a bit of apparatus on a bridge cable designed to listen for pings, which mean a wire in the, in the composite cable is broken. Um, so you can keep a, a tally of how many wires are broken in that cable and do something about it if need be. So there we are. We've looked at a variety of cable of failures, discussed why failures happen, looked at how metals deform and how to make them stronger, listed reasons for failure and found there are so many different reasons, concluded that while we know a lot more about structural and other failures than we did, there will always be the unexpected around the corner. And now my work is done. Time to get down and write another talk. The end. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful, Ian. Thank you ever so well much. Done. For that. that was well, that was trivial. Well. I think what's what's great is that you uh, tell us about things that are so complicated but in a very uh, easy way to understand. I mean, we all learned an enormous lot. And after all, one of the key roles of the youth ray is learning, and we certainly learned an enormous lot. Thank you. I think um, my own sort of observations are, uh, f firstly, uh, some of these uh, mistakes are happening awful, particularly where it involves human life. But one of the good things about failures is learning from mistakes and failures. And I think uh, what, what, what it does, I think, is add to the body of, knowledge so that uh, uh, it's learning the hard way but my goodness it does mean that we can hopefully ensure that uh, mistakes don't happen in the future the other thing which i think is is now very apparent but particularly from the last part of your uh, your talk in is the crucial importance of maintenance yes, yes. Uh, and uh, i i worry sometimes about whether 
some of these structures are maintained to the sort of standards that uh, one would expect because they are so complex, these structures. There's such a lot of uh, science and engineering that goes into it all. Um, but as you say, in many cases, it's the weather. It's the weather that can really take its toll. And, and um, I ought to add that uh, maintenance costs money. Uh, yes, yes. So there's, 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 yes. Sure there's um, a, a, a trend to try and reduce the amount of money spent and skimp on maintenance. And if you cut corners, then we can all see the result. Yes. Now, sadly, Ron, I've got to leave, but I'll leave you to discuss. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. The discussion, but I'm looking forward to seeing the recording on this party. And okay. So, uh, once again, my, my thanks to you, uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Right. I think I will give a vote of thanks now, Ian, and then we'll leave the floor open for questions. Okay. That was absolutely brilliant. All those charts and everything that you'd coordinated together, um, showing your scientific knowledge so well. Most interesting because you covered such a wide range, covering the buildings and aircraft and different interests of of how things fail really and why it happens. What I'd like to ask you is how did you get interested in science and engineering and maths and physics in the beginning? What got you well, interested? Um, I can remember, I can remember what happened. I found that I didn't understand people, but I understood things. Ah, and so that was the beginning. Uh, and so when we at, at school in the we that we, we we at the having at the end of the fourth form we were able to start to specialize too early I think but that was the way it was then and you basically that specialization divided pupils up into arts or science and it was obvious to me that I was in the science law and it just uh, developed from there. I found it all fascinating. I found it uh, interesting that I didn't find it too hard, whereas lots of people did. And uh, it just mushroomed, and I've spent all my life in science. And you probably have a very good teacher. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. We, we remember the names of good teachers, don't yeah. we? Yeah. <laughs> I think what you've shown us this morning, Ian, is that how much you learned and understood, but applied into practice, and then made that as an important factor in your working life um, mm -hmm. to help things going properly and not failing, which is so important because we need our engineers and our scientists. And we also need the people there to say that they think it's not going to be able to work and strong enough to hold their case yes, yes. when profit becomes such an important factor in decision making. Yes. Um, and that's when our scientists and our engineers are most important to us. So thank you, because I thought the way that you'd combined all your charts and found all your material yeah. was absolutely fantastic because you were covering such a vast complex topic but you managed it so well so oh, thank, thank you very much thank, thank you. you thank you christine thank you now over to you um for questions um john petty john i i remember hmm, a long 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 time ago did you do you remember the liberty ship problem oh yes yes they were they were welded rather than riveted uh, as right. the fact that they were welded meant that the cracks actually that was due to cold as well the, was. the, the cracks the brittle cracks were able to to that grow across the whole of the ship yeah. uh, and the ship felt the ships broke in two and if they'd yeah. been riveted the crack would have gone to the end of a plate and not gone any further that's the right fact that they were welded was the problem yeah it was during the war the, Amer the americans were coming into the war and there was a terrific need for shipping because they were losing so much in the Atlantic. And the Americans decided they would weld the ships and they were producing them at a phenomenal rate. But I believe that it was also the low temperature because they found that the ones that went 
threw them off the land, with the ones that were killed. Anything that kept to the southern routes was all right. So it's a combination of temperature and the fact, as you say, they were welded. Yeah. The cracks hadn't got anywhere to go except further. Yeah, that, that's the first one I remember. Mm. Hazel. Um, I understood they were only built for one journey. That's all that many of them did. Yes. Well, I think they're only built for one journey because they weren't expecting. Yeah. Regarding steel, I heard that they were found accidentally. Stainless steel was found accidentally. There was a wrong job done, whatever the job was and how it was done. So it was dumped yeah. and left there and left there and then never went rusty. No. Um, that's right, and uh, the, the, the reason it, uh, it doesn't do that is because it contains chromium, and the chromium produces a surface film of Cr2O3, which is protective. And if you, the interesting thing about it is if you scratch that film, it reforms and, and maintains the protection, and that's why stainless steel stays stainless. So that stuff you scratch off eventually wear away? No, because it reforms. How? Oh. Well, the air reacts with the chromium in the steel in the same way as it did originally. Oh, yeah. And that's the, that's the unusual part about it. Scratch the CR203 off the stainless steel and you expose the underlying stainless steel to the air and that forms new oxide. What I like particularly, um, Ian, is that not only could you prepare a fascinating um, presentation, but you're absolutely fantastic and answering questions as well, showing your great strength of knowledge. Really impressive. Thank you. Very good. Could could I say something? Yes, oh, do. Um, I can't, Hi, Sandy. My, can't right, see you I at the moment. I can't get my picture to come up. No, but anyway, do, um, go ahead. Thanks for saying um, that I asked, when I was chair, I asked Ian if he would join the committee. And um, I, he actually came forward to me after one of my pleas for people to come on the committee and said he felt that perhaps he ought to get involved and do something, which was very good. And um, so I asked him at the time, you know, I said, well, we are possibly going to need a new chair. Have you chair committees or done anything like that? You know, have you been a committee person? He said, oh, yes, I've done a bit. <laughs> uh, so that was interesting. So when I got home, being a bit of a researcher, because I used to enjoy doing history, I looked up him in, on Google. And here we have an international scientist in the nuclear industry um, who had chaired international committees and been all over the place. So I thought, well, I think Ian would be OK. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Sandy. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> well, I thought, I thought I could now say it as you told us about your, your background in science yeah. and the nuclear world that you were at one stage in so um i thought it wouldn't matter if i now said it <laughs> yeah thank you very much for that yeah and welcome to um russ who's joined us this morning welcome russ good to see you as well very interesting i'll be tuning in in the future yes thank you thank you I can't, i'm not very mobile so i can't come to any meetings no yeah. no well that's the idea of these yes. as well Really, yes. it's good. Yes, thank you. Yes, that is the idea. Arthur, did you want to add anything as a as an engineer? Can I put you on the spot? Well, that, yes, that's very kind of you. Um, I, I will. I wasn't going to push myself forward, but uh, listening to Ian and uh, watching the, um, especially the uh, Tacoma Bridge, uh, violently oscillating in, in the wind, and then of course building up and then collapsing. Reminds me, everyone knows the uh, transmitter tower at Stockland Hill, uh, the television transmitter, you know? Yeah. Uh, and that, that tower is actually 700 feet high and it's held in place with guy ropes or guy cables. And uh, many years ago, uh, the, the maintenance team carried some work out on the, uh, on the tower. And I can't remember every single detail but after that, uh, it was in, in, in a high wind situation, uh, one of the cables, maybe more, violently started oscillating. 
and 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 they just didn't know why. And and of course the oscillations would have probably uh, you know weakened weakened the whole tower, you know. So the engineers sat round and they're scratching their heads, and then the maintenance guy comes along sweeping the floor. I might exaggerate slightly, but he said, "I know what the trouble is." And they said, "Look, leave it to us. We're engineers. We've got we got degrees. We know what we're doing." You see, <laughs> and he said, "No, I'm pretty sure." And eventually, they listened to him. Well, he said it was okay until you greased the cables. <laughs> And they said, yes, and because one of the things in fault finding is one of the major things. You say, what was the situation before? What was it afterwards? Has the, has the fault been caused by some change in procedure, you see? Yes. And they looked into it, and they found that the grease in the wind had formed an aerofoil. Yeah, yeah. And because as the wind blew th through the aerofoil, it acted just like a plane wind. It just lifted up and then it fell down again and it lifted up and the whole lot went into this resonant oscillation. Yeah. And they stripped all the grease off the cable or maybe cables and if it was all right again. Did you, I guess that rings a bell, Ian? Well, it, I, I haven't heard of that detail, but I'd like to comment. Um, the other aspect is that uh, some of the grease probably seeped in between the cables and lubricated the interface of, of one cable and another, meaning that the resonant frequency of the whole thing changed. <laughs> so, so I suspect the ingress of grease uh, between some of the cables also helped to, to yeah. cause the problem. Uh -huh, mm. uh -huh, yeah. yeah, there we go. Mm. Oh, thank you, Arthur. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to say something. Yeah, no, important. Yeah. Well, it's important, the engineers. And of course, I must mention the architects as well, who I haven't mentioned yet. Of course, obviously, <laughs> they play the most important part. Um, it's interesting, my um, husband studied architecture. And uh, when we went to see the Scottish Parliament, I was taking photographs of the beautiful seats and the furniture and how lovely it looked. And he'd gone round and he'd taken pho photographs of all the faults that he could see. <laughs> and he came home with two completely different photographs of the Scottish Parliament. Um, and I was interested to see Ian's photograph he'd taken of that building. Where was mm. the building, Ian? Was this with the spalling? Yes. Yes, yes. That, that was Nottingham University. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, oh gracious. Yes, because that's obviously the other important factor is all the architects in all of this and uh, the long training that they have to do as well over seven years. I mean, it's a long time. Yeah. Um, really difficult sort of course, isn't it? Yeah. I'm a fully qualified architect. Yeah. Um, but yes, fascinating. Anyone else want to say anything? Mm -hmm. Margaret has got a hand up. Yeah, Margaret. Weren't, weren't there resonance problems with, was it the Millennium Bridge? Yes, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, yes, it was. And was it in the 70s? It's a different material, but was it in the 70s there were, when there was this concrete cancer problem? Uh, concrete was, started disintegrating, uh, well, which uh, interested me because uh, it was high alumina cements that yeah. were decaying and it was clear that the engineers or whoever the designers hadn't talked to geologists no. because most rock forming minerals are high alumina a high, yeah. high aluminium yeah and to make the high aluminium cement they were presumably incorporating a lot more feldspars mm. and the the micas in the feldspars when they get damp as in swimming pool environments where there was a lot of problem, the, the feldspars decay into clay minerals. So the concrete was decaying into a clay. Yeah. It wasn't a surprise that it collapsed. No, no. I mean, that, that's a, another example of degradation of materials. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, so well, I'm not even an undergraduate, but not a general yeah. undergraduate would know that. But not. Yes, I know. Uh, talking about bridges and resonance, um, it's well known that um, when you had uh, battalions of army people marching across bridges, they were oh, yeah. taught to break step right, yeah. so that they didn't all hit the ground at the same time and cause a resonance then. No. Jenny. 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 We heard recently about that aquarium in a hotel. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. We haven't heard anything since. No. 
the faults or anything, have we? No, no, we haven't. Uh, I remember that, and I, I don't really know any, anything more about it. Um, but I sent it, it was presumably a glass structure, yeah. and I presume there was some weakness in the in the glass or the, or the the joints holding the glass together. But I don't know. I'm only guessing. Yeah. Yes, because they said that they they got sort of glass that would take a certain gunshot, an explosion. But when you were talking about um, chemicals that affect things, I was wondering what they'd been putting in for the fish and cleaning yes. the water within it. Yes, yes, possibly. And nobody, it's quite possible that nobody took account of any of that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There was only one fish survived, wasn't there, I believe? <laughs> oh, really? That's, that's what they said. <laughs> Pat, Pat, you got your hand up. Yes. And the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco is always sort of pretty solid, but as you cross over it, it does sway in high wind, yeah. but I think it must be very well maintained. But, uh, you know, is it, is it very safe? Yes. And, and another point you've, you've raised there, or a related point, um, everything extends when you apply a stress, whether it's a wind stress or whatever. And very often, if it's been designed properly, it's been designed to actually move in uh, response to stressors. Um, and it, if, if it's been designed properly, they will know that that movement is well within the safe operating uh, uh, mm -hmm. circumstances. What, mm -hmm. what, ten, what, what you've got to avoid is stopping that movement because that can create more problems than it solves. Brian, you had your hand up. Um, yes, I did. Um, you've got me thinking about, I used to live in a sort of 400-year-old um, cottage. Um, it was cob built, but it had a big metal rod going through it, both sides of the exterior were, um, yeah. wall. And um, I was just wondering in terms of corrosion or... I mean, you see so many of these um, these sort of strengthening things, um, and I don't know whether they're ever checked <laughs> by anybody. I think that those uh, they're, they're obviously designed to stop the walls buckling outwards, yeah. just to yeah. hold them in. Uh, but they're so over-engineered that I think corrosion is going to be a, a uh, not going to be a problem. You know, they're very very stout. Because where I live presently, it's only 100 years, just over 100 years old, but actually it's an end terrace. And between my end terrace, there's a small road, very small road, and then there's another end terrace. And my house has got a, an X going through it at the top, oh, which yeah. I understand, oh, it was never explained to me, but I understand from other things that I had to do when I moved into the house to tie the walls and the, and the roof in, that there's a problem of a vacuum being caused there with, with the wind going down between the two. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. Again, I don't think that's been ever checked. It's never, it, it didn't show uh, in any report when I bought it. Or... No. Talking about the wind blowing and causing a vacuum, has anybody ever looked at their toilet when the wind's been blowing? The 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 uh, pipe that vents the the waste pipe up to the roof. When you when the wind blows over it, it creates a partial vacuum above it, which causes the water into the in the toilet to move up and down, in the U bend. <laughs> and, and that way, you can gauge how strong the wind is outside by watching the water in the toilet. <laughs> I think on that note, um, Ian, we will perhaps end because we've got to after half past 11. Yes. So thank you again ever so much. Absolutely fantastic. Well researched, well delivered and wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.